I believe Sandlot Baseball is vital to um, the growth, not just of the game of baseball, but to our communities. Touted as the golden age of Cleveland baseball, the Sandlot Baseball League of Cleveland took off during the 40s, bringing in top talent from across the city and professional leagues. Now, nearly 80 years later, the former players of the league are reuniting, honoring America's favorite pastime. It's just, it's just awesome to all of us. It lets us know that, you know what? We played at a time when Sandlot Baseball was big, and it really was. So much so that all the games of the Sandlot in Class A, the results were posted in the Cleveland Plain Dealer and in the Cleveland Press uh, after every game, the box scores. So we're quite, very proud of uh, what the Cleveland Sandlot program has done for baseball in the city of Cleveland and for the game itself. And we're very grateful to the museum for giving us this venue to celebrate those great years. The first plaque we, we uh, gave out was to, uh, in honor of Ray Schmatzer, who was uh, an icon, a legend in, in Cleveland Sandlot baseball for over 40 years, coaching, uh, playing himself, and dedicating his life to serving the youth of the city of Cleveland. The other gentleman was John S. Nagy, 40-year recreation commissioner for the city of Cleveland. And this man was the key force uh, in Sandlot Baseball in Cleveland. Reunions are slated to be held yearly on the last Saturday of August. For TV20, this is Alex Picturna. For more information or to make a donation to the Baseball Heritage Museum at League Park, you can visit baseballheritagemuseum.org forward slash donation. Well, TV20 is streaming live 24-7. Visit tv20cleveland.com to see our live feed and more. Stay connected with TV20 wherever you go by liking and following us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page to watch our numerous programs. Coming up next, learn about what's going on with the Cleveland Metropolitan Schools with this week's CMSD 360. Thanks for watching TV20 News. I'm Dan Monroe. Be sure to stay tuned for more on TV20. We are Cleveland. I'm Darielle Snipes with the CMSD News Bureau. Welcome to CMSD 360, a look at news happening around the district for the week of September 4th. There'll be no school and all facilities will be closed on Monday for Labor Day, a day set aside in honor of all our hardworking men and women. September is Attendance Awareness Month. CMSD and the Cleveland Browns Foundation and the Stay in the Game Network have teamed up to reduce chronic absenteeism. With a rise in chronic absenteeism during the pandemic, the district is relaunching its Get to School, You Can Make It attendance campaign with a pep rally scheduled for 11 a.m. on Wednesday at East Professional Center. You can follow online with a link shown on your screen. Also on Wednesday, CMSD and the community will celebrate the renaming of the former Thomas Jefferson International Newcomers Academy in honor of the late Natividad Pagan. The celebration will begin at 1 at the school located at 3145 West 46th Street. Natividad Pagan International Newcomers Academy is one of three schools that have been renamed through a process the Board of Education initiated in 2021. Pagan was an administrator who ran CMSD's multilingual, multicultural program. She was also a principal at Joseph N. Gallagher's school and at Thomas Jefferson International Newcomers Academy. Last week, the district celebrated the renaming of the former Patrick Henry School in honor of the late Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones. This is video of the event last week. On Saturday, Max Hayes High School will hold a car show and motorcycle and car wash fundraiser from 10 to 2 at the school located at 2211 West 65th Street. If you want to wash, it will be $20 per vehicle. The funds raised will go toward student activities. Looking ahead, 
Open houses will be on September 14th for most high schools and September 15th through pre-K and K-8 schools. Students whose schools are holding open houses will be dismissed early. Open houses will run from 6 to 8 p.m. each day. CEO Eric Gordon will deliver the annual State of the Schools address on Wednesday, September 21st at the Renaissance Cleveland Hotel. To order tickets, go to cityclub.org slash forums. Stay connected with what's going on in the district by downloading the CMSD app or following CMSD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Well, thanks for watching CMSD 360. Have a great and productive week. The City of Cleveland's recycling program has relaunched and I'd like to share a few recycling do's and don'ts. All materials should be mixed, loose, and unbagged in blue carts. No plastic bags or plastic films in your blue carts. These are not acceptable materials. Bottles, jugs, and cans should be emptied and lightly rinsed. Labels do not need to be removed. Ignore the recycling symbol and numbers on items. Only items listed as accepted materials should be placed in blue carts. And lastly, when in doubt, throw it out. If you're not sure if something is recyclable, place it in the black trash bin to avoid contaminating recyclables with non-acceptable items. Anything not listed as an acceptable item should not be placed in the blue recycling cart. For more information and quick tips, visit sustainablecleveland.org.
Welcome to Crafting with Rec. My name is Miss Ashley, and today we are having a special Halloween edition. We are making costumes today. And today, this is my co-host. This is Miss Abigail, and she is modeling our first costume today. This is our candy button costume. Yes. <laughs> so, So over the next few minutes, I'm gonna go over how to make this costume with you. The supplies that we are going to need today is a white t-shirt. White t-shirt. A hot glue gun. A hot glue gun. Glue sticks. Glue sticks. And a sponge. Some Mod Podge. Some Mod Podge. A few different colors of paint. A few different colors of paint. A knife. And, um, some foam balls. Some foam balls. All right. So let's get started. So the first thing that we're going to do today is you're going to want to make sure that you have an adult with you because this is going to be a very dangerous part. So I'm not going to let Miss Abigail do this. I'm going to do this myself. So if Miss Abby, do you want to have a seat? All right. So what we're going to do is we're very, very carefully going to use our box cutter or our knife and cut our foam balls right in half. So when you buy these at the store, you get them in a pack of 12 and you need 10 of them to make the same shirt that Abigail is wearing. So if you go through and you cut 10 of them very, very carefully in half, as you can see, you'll be able to One, make... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 20, very good. You will, will have 20 all together when you're done. So we're not gonna cut all of them right now. We're just gonna cut a few. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, we're gonna cut six. Because one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, yeah, okay. <laughs> so it's very important that you, whenever you're using something sharp like a knife or a box cutter, you want to keep your fingers. Or scissors. Or scissors, very good. You want to. But I can use little scissors. You can use little scissors. You want to keep your fingers far away from them because you don't want to cut yourself. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good job. All right. So once you get all of your balls cut, you're going to move on to painting them. So we're gonna find a paper plate, or I have a nice palette here that I'm gonna use. And we're gonna put that right here. And you wanna do the pink ones? All right, so we're just gonna pick one color. You wanna do blue? Right. So we're gonna do the blue. So right now we're gonna start with our blue and the first thing you wanna do is you wanna shake your bottle first. Can you shake it really good for me? Good job. All right, I think that's nice and shake it up. So pull it for me. All right, so we're just gonna put some on our palette. <laughs> And there's a couple different ways you can paint these. So you can either use a brush or you can use a sponge. I'd like to use the sponge. I want to use the brush. You're going to use the brush? All right. I want to use the funny one with the... You want to use the funny one? Yeah. Okay, you can use the funny one. So we're going to dip into our paint. And then we're going to very carefully, we're going to start painting our candy buttons. Good job. That's in my hand. That's okay. And the good thing about this paint is if you get them on your hands, 
can just wipe it off. Yeah, you either want to have some paper towels or something that you can either wipe your hands off or you always want to make sure to wash your hands too after you're done. Because you don't want to get paint. All over your hands. Well, you don't want to get it all over your house either. <laughs> so if you use a sponge, you can you just want to dab it on like this. Can I use that? You want to try the sponge? And it gives it a nice, even coat. Yeah. And you just want to set those aside to dry. I'm going to try the sponge now. Paint the bottom. You can paint the bottom. If you're interested in doing crafts like this or anything, uh, arts related, we have plenty of ceramic classes, family classes at Cadell Fine Arts and the phone number for that is 216-664-4183. Uh, we offer classes Monday through Friday. We offer homeschool arts, family clay, family arts. We even offer things for just adults or just youth as well. All right, so now that we have all of our candy buttons painted, we're gonna take a quick break and let them dry. Yes. And we will be right back. back. Uh, we're gonna go wash our hands real quick and we'll be right back with the next step. Yes. All right, let's go wash our hands. Hi, I'm Peter. And there's nothing I love more than sharing vegetables with my friends. Come on in! Help yourself to anything. That's why we give our food the utmost respect it deserves. Did you know there are simple steps we can all take to help save food? You can cook it, store it, even share it. Just don't waste it. Because when it comes to food, better ate than never. To learn more, visit savethefood.com. Need food? We can help. The Greater Cleveland Food Bank's Benefits Outreach Department works within the community to help individuals locate food and apply for SNAP and other public benefits. Weekdays, our Help Center accepts phone calls from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. and walk-ins from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Call 216-738-2067 or stop in our facility at 15500 South Waterloo Road. Our benefits outreach counselors are out in the community every day assisting with benefit enrollment and connecting the community to vital resources. Keep your eye out for our food truck, providing free, fresh produce and SNAP enrollment in the community. For more information, visit www.greaterclevelandfoodbank.org slash get help. Welcome back to Crafting with Rec. I'm Miss Ashley and this is Abby. Abby, and we are ready for our next step. So we have yeah. all of our candy buttons yes. cut in half and painted. Yes. And now it is time to seal them. Let's so see. we're going to use this really cool stuff. So this is actually glittery. Wow. <laughs> you want to touch glittery. it? Glittery. You want to shake it for me? Shake it up really good. Good job. All right, good job. All right, so we're gonna put a little bit on our palette. Can I pour it? No, nope, I'm gonna pour it. I wanna help you. You're, you're gonna hold it? Good job. It doesn't look very glittery. It'll be more glittery once it dries. All right, so once again, we're gonna use either a brush or a sponge. You want to use the sponge? Yeah. All right, you can use the sponge. I want to use the funny brush. Uh, the funny brush is dirty right now, so you can use the sponge. I want to use another paintbrush. You want to use another paintbrush? There you go. This is kind of hard. That's okay, just go like this. Yep, if your paintbrush is brand new and it's a little stiff, you can go like this. And it should be nice and soft to use. All right. A little cracky right here, but it's fine. That's okay. It'll get soft as we use it. 
All right, so which color are you gonna paint glitter on? I'm gonna paint this one, this one, this one. All right, so you're gonna, so pick the one you're gonna start with. I'm gonna start with a yellow one. I'm gonna start with blue. All right, so pick up a blue one. All right, there you go. And just like we did the first time, you're gonna cover the whole button. Well, how am I gonna see? Because it'll be shiny. How am I gonna see it without the do oh. You see how mine's shiny? Mm -hmm. So this is gonna make our button nice and shiny. So when I was your age, this was one of my favorite candies I would get. And if it has a holes in it, um. it, you just keep on going and do what you do. Yeah, you can fill those holes in with, yeah, with our top coat. Yep. You can sit it down, kind yeah, of paint yeah. all around it. Good job, keep going. You are doing a great job, Abigail. One is ready. All right. We pick another color. If one is ready, that's fine. You just pick another color. So all of these materials that we're using today are materials that you can get at your local craft store or even your dollar store. So I was able to get all of these at the craft store and even my paints I was able to get all in one package. So they all came together. Everything. Everything, yep. And these are the colors that are normally in a candy button package, but you can use your favorite colors. So you can make um, green, or green, orange, red. Orange. You can make any type of one, one color if you want. Yep. All right. Now I want it. So we're gonna finish painting these. Paint? So we're gonna finish painting our top coat on these. Yes. And then we're going to take another quick break and wash our hands and make sure we wash our brushes very good because yes. this top coat is just like a glue. And if we don't wash it completely out of our brushes, they're it's going to be hard. Yeah, they're going to get hard and they're not, we're not going to be able to use them again, are we? No. Nope. So you have to throw them away and use your other one. Yeah, so we want to make sure we clean up very, very good today. So we're gonna finish these up, take a quick break, and we'll see you for the next part. Yep. Until all our daughters are safe. Until all our children have families. Until all our families have homes. Until all our parents are cared for, we'll be here. Welcome back. We are all done with painting and sealing our candy buttons, and now we. We are going to glue them with this hot glue. Yep. Now we are ready for our final step. For this step, we're going to need our white t-shirt, yes. our hot glue gun, our glue sticks, and our finished candy buttons. Can I put the glue sticks in? You want to help me put the glue sticks in? Yeah. So during our break, Abby made a very good point. Our hot glue gun is very, very hot. Hence the name. Yes. <laughs> so this is a point where you want to make sure you have an adult with you again. Yes. This is something that you don't want to put your fingers anywhere near this part of the, the tool. 
You don't want to, and you also want to make sure that you don't put your fingers in the glue once it comes out. That will lead to very bad burns. Yeah, it doesn't feel good, does it? No. So now that we've talked about glue gun safety, I want to talk about our shirt that we're going to use. So Abby, do you want to stand up again? So as you can see, we used a t-shirt, but our t-shirt on Abby is like a dress. So we picked a, oh, yeah. We picked a t-shirt that was a couple sizes too big for us. And that way, it's going to fit like a dress instead of fitting. It's a normal body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's silly, huh? <laughs> Abby finds it very silly that, no, we cannot take that off. Do I have one on me? No, you don't have, but they can hear you with mine. Wow, yeah, wow. <laughs> so Abby finds it very silly that her t-shirt fits her like a dress. So if you're doing this for someone at like Abby's age, you may wanna do a, and they're in a toddler size, you may wanna use a youth size. Um, for someone who's in a youth size, you may want to use an adult size. Yes. As we are getting our shirt ready, you want to make sure that we are working on a flat, stable surface. So something like a kitchen table or a desk, a craft surface that you may have at your house always works best for me. Another little trick that I found works, especially if you're using something like a hot glue gun, is if you have wax paper, parchment paper, anything that you use for baking. Like this. Like this. If you have anything like that in your kitchen, you may want to, or even a piece of cardboard or a piece of paper. Yeah? Put it on You may want to put that between your two layers of shirt so your glue doesn't stick and you don't have a you shirt that's glued together. You hold this side, I'll hold this side. Okay, but we're actually gonna put that inside the shirt. Okay. All right, so we're gonna... Open up the shirt. Yep, you wanna open up the shirt for me? Good job. See, you are an excellent helper. I wanna make sure it's in there. You wanna make sure it's all the way in there? It's all the way in there. Over a little, and there we go. All right. So this parchment paper works with just one sheet, as this is a youth small. But as you get larger size shirts, you may need to do two sets of paper in there. But since this is just wide enough, we're only going to do one. And then before you start gluing it, it is always best to map out where you want things to go. So Abby and I decided that we're going to do flowers instead of regular candy buttons. A flower smiley face. Yeah, it kind of looks like a smiley face, huh? These are the two eyes. This is the mouth. These are the cheeks. Yep, those are its cheeks. All right, you ready to start gluing them down? All right, so you want to just put a nice dollop of hot glue on the back. You just stick them down. You're almost running out. You only have that much left. Yeah. I'll let you know when we're ready. I know. I know when to give you another one. Okay. You need another one yet? Not yet. Still in there. Can they even bend? No, we're not gonna bend them. They can bend. All right, so I'm ready for another one. You're gonna put it in for me? I'm gonna be kind of careful. Yeah, be very careful. Good job. Good job. All right, so once we get them all glued down, Yep, good job. We want to check and make sure we didn't miss any. I checked this one. All right. So then, 
Once we check all of our work, we're gonna pull our parchment out. See how nice and easy that comes out? We can actually save this for another project. Yes. <laughs> and look at that, that's our flower candy button shirt. I'm kinda of scared. And I'm gonna have Miss Abby stand back up for us. <laughs> So she can show us her, her completed look. And the way we had her style this today is she has some black leggings on and it's nice and warm outside today. So she didn't need another shirt on underneath, but if you, she was gonna go out trick or treating in this, we would probably have her put a long sleeve t-shirt on under this, or maybe even put a jacket over top. And then another fun thing we had her do with her hair is we mimicked our candy buttons on her head <laughs> we gave her no, some nice fun space buns and then we used some fun colored hair <laughs> spray paint and spray painted those purple to match her shirt. Thank you for watching today. My name is again is Miss Ashley and this is my co-host Abigail and this was Crafting with Rec. If you're interested in any classes that we offer here at Cadell Fine Arts, our phone number is 216-664-4183. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. The City of Cleveland's recycling program has relaunched and I'd like to share a few recycling do's and don'ts. All materials should be mixed, loose, and unbagged in blue carts. No plastic bags or plastic films in your blue carts. These are not acceptable materials. Bottles, jugs, and cans should be emptied and lightly rinsed. Labels do not need to be removed. Ignore the recycling symbol and numbers on items. Only items listed as accepted materials should be placed in blue carts. And lastly, when in doubt, throw it out. If you're not sure if something is recyclable, place it in the black trash bin to avoid contaminating recyclables with non-acceptable items. Anything not listed as an acceptable item should not be placed in the blue recycling cart. For more information and quick tips, visit sustainablecleveland.org.
on just a couple more seconds. What we got? Nine? All right, give me the countdown. Mrs. Garth. Mrs. Garth. Okay. All right, let me know when you're ready. You good? Ready? All right. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Griffin, Bishop, Here. Conwell, Gray, Hairston, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormack, Mooney, Valencic, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. Will everyone please rise for a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Clerk, please dispense with the journal. Motion by Council Member Harrison that the reading of the, of the minutes of the last meeting be dispensed with and the journal approved. Second by Council Member Mooney. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. At this time, we'll go into public commenters. And uh, first, I have Cheryl Wagner from Ward 9, and she's here to talk about homelessness, treatment facilities, and shelter. Mrs. Wagner. Is Ms. Wagner here? Ms. Wagner? Okay, I don't see Ms. Wagner. I'll move to the next person. Uh, have Katrina Robinson from Ward 11. She's here to talk about mortgage retaliation, discrimination, wrongful foreclosure. Is Katrina Robinson available? Ms. Robinson, you have the floor. Please acknowledge your time. Everyone has three minutes. You have a warning light right there in the front. Hello, my name is Katrina Robinson. I'm a homeowner that was a first time, went through a home, first time home writer program through Cleveland Housing Network in 2002. I consider myself a nigger, African American, black woman who lost her home through illegal evictions that took place under Ward 11 on Lorraine and 127th in Cleveland, Ohio. Since 2010, my home, ship, my home ownership rights were violated by law that intacted and wiped out and destabilized the Negro and African American black communities, including the inheritance of my family and other family rights to inherit our property and our wealth. Um, I say this because I believe in the 14th Amendment that the state have failed me in depriving my rights of liberty, freedom, and property with a fair due process. I spent since 2018 to 2002, fighting and providing documents and showing up at every hearing and moratorium as people from outside of the states attacked me and took my property. Um, the lender who took my ownership of my home breached the mortgage contract by failing me sort to help sort out the pandemic and mortgage crisis. Instead, used the opportunity with outside of third parties to collect debt that never existed after May 2010. All my reports were filed in HUD counseling agencies. No nonprofit would help me. No one would help me um, sort out the crisis and the e economic hardship that it caused me. I used the same lender that was connected to other third parties outside of the states, came in, and were allowed to be able to take away even further rights. I went through the Cleveland housing, during the pandemic, I went through the Cleveland housing um, municipal court that was in proper procedure against my home ownership during a federal monitorium against automatic bankruptcy stay. The federal court have now, I wrote to them telling them my story and giving them the timeline, how long it took me, how many helps I went to, how many city programs I went through, how many people I set, how many legal aid assistance I went through, and they accepted my case but I'm not strong enough to represent myself on the federal level, but they did accept my um, claim far as me having a bankruptcy and that I shouldn't have never been in none of the courts. 
I filed all my claims in 2017, stating that I was a bankruptcy in May of 2000, stating that it was discharged, stating that I wasn't in debt. I went through, and some of the banks were Bank of America, Key Bank, and Bank of America, I realized now wasn't even, had a fiduciary duty in this jurisdiction to even assist me while I went through a city program. No one from my inner city would help me, and other homeowners, and such as my cousins and families who were single parent women, homes were taken from us, and we were left without, and some of them and their families are homeless even to this case, and even today, I am homeless because of these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Sympathize with you, but thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right, next up we have Gwen Stenbridge, Ward 11, to talk about conversion therapy band, and she's with the Trevor Project. Yes, by the Trevor Project. She's being paid by the Trevor Project. And is Ms. Stembridge here? Is Gwen Stembridge here? Okay, we don't see Gwen Stembridge. I'll now move to Beverly Owens. And Beverly Owens is with Ward 5, and she wants to talk about the maintenance of vacant lots, high grass, and cleanup. Is Beverly Owens available? Please acknowledge your time. Hello everyone, my name is Beverly Owens and I currently live in Ward 5. Actually, I'm a recovering drug addict and a victim of domestic violence where I spent a lot of my homeless days right there in King Kennedy, right down the street where I currently own my home. Um, this is new development. I've been there for the 16 years since it's been in existence and I continue to call, email, text the city of Cleveland about the vacant lots the high grass where it keeps the animals. We even have deer sometime. Um, it's a safety issue and concern. I've taken myself and one of my neighbors to go out there and clean the grass that has grown from the vacant lots over to the side lots across the sidewalk where you are unable to walk down the sidewalk. I was told you shouldn't do that, but I take pride in where I live at, and I would wish and hope that individuals that are in the um, power to take pride in the homes and the neighborhood in which I reside. Once again, I just want to bring the attention to the city council and anybody else that would listen. If you're not going to cut the lots, if you're not going to keep them clean, then build homes. If you're not going to build homes, then I feel that those late lots should be maintained in a fashion that us as homeowners can get back the pride that we've had when we purchased those homes. We're left there to defend, on, defend ourselves. It's not important, and the streets are becoming very raggedy. And everybody know what raggedy means. It's a shame to walk down our street and to endure what homeowners have to endure. Not that it's right because the projects is on the other end, but I speak for homeowners because we're often told we're not low income. We don't need the help. The help is not there for us. So I just want to close this by saying, have a little respect for us and in the neighborhoods that we live in because we do have respect for ourselves. And that's what I want to say. Thank you, Ms. Owens. Next, we have Matthew Ann, Matthew Ahn, Ward 3, to talk about Shot Spotter. Mr. Ahn. Good evening. All right. Uh, my name is Matthew Ahn. Um, Y'all probably know me by this point. I'm a law professor at CSU. I am here to uh, talk in my personal capacity uh, about the potential use of $2.7 million in ARPA funds on ShotSpotter. Now, fancy technology may seem like an efficient crime-fighting tool, but I've written articles about how technological algorithms don't typically remove bias, they just sugarcoat it. And ShotSpotter ends up being the worst of both worlds. It's sold as an algorithm, but is ultimately at the mercy of human decision-making. When Sylvan Simmons was shot in the back three times by a Rochester police officer. ShotSpotter initially reported the three gunshots as a helicopter. Then Rochester PD asked them to go back, and they said three shots. Then Rochester PD asked them to go back again, and they said four shots, which was consistent with police testimony that Sylvan Simmons had shot first, which was later disproven in court. 
This has happened multiple times in Chicago as well, including in the cases of Ernesto Godinez and Michael Williams. Chicago PD both times received second reports with more gunshots fired, one of them an entire mile away from the first report. In short, ShotSpotter's ability for and history of manipulation means it has no value as a tool. It's being used to fabricate evidence, but not even good evidence. Prosecutors have withdrawn ShotSpotter evidence time and again when it might get challenged in court as unconstitutional, including for Williams, who spent one year in jail on later dismissed charges. This is all without mentioning Adam Toledo, a 13-year-old child that Chicago Police Department killed in response to a shot spotter report, despite him having his hands up and, of course, empty. If police are responding to unreliable shot spotter reports expecting to encounter dangerous individuals, the next Adam Toledo or Sylvan Simmons is just around the corner. I'm not even going to have time to talk about the privacy issues with setting up 2,000 microphones across the city that are always on and always listening. There's more than just anecdotes, though. A massive study of all shot spotter jurisdictions published by Johns Hopkins, the University of Connecticut, in 2021, concluded that shot spotter had no statistically significant impact on gun violence or on police response times. Another, um, and indeed, in cities similar to Cleveland, the gun violence rate actually went up over the course of the 18-year trial period. In addition, numerous studies have noted that police forces are often more overworked after ShotSpotter's implementation, since ShotSpotter false alarms still result in dispatch and investigation. And so for those who believe that the current force is understaffed and overstretched, ShotSpotter will make the job and recruitment and retention less desirable. Cleveland has spent about $30 million in police violence settlements in the last decade. Three million of that went to Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams, whose car backfiring was mistaken as a gunshot. Apparently, we want to try to create a zone in the entire city where this can happen. And so I urge the mayor's office and council to turn back from this harmful policy, and I hope that if it comes up for a vote, that you will understand the history and implementation of spots, shot spots, and vote no. Thank you. Time. Next, we have David Leon Jackson, uh, Ward 8 Gun Control. Please acknowledge your time, sir. All right, I'd like to talk to everyone about gun control. What I really mean by that is gun registration. It seems to me it's a simple enough thing to do to create a law or a rule or ordinance in your municipality that you would treat guns like you do automobiles. Automobiles need to be registered, need a registration for automobiles. Why not guns? Now you want to go into assault weapons, I think where you have to have a CDL to drive your bigger trucks. So if you have your, somebody who want to have a assault weapon, maybe you can create a license for that. And on top of it, I think if you were to give it the idea of some thought, it would also generate revenue for your city, even across the country. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and I usually don't respond, but I will um, would love to have a further conversation with you about that. Council did pass that law uh, probably four years ago to register all guns in the state struck down the language, um, but I would love to hear some more of your ideas around that. Thank you. Uh, next up is Mickey Hardwick Lett, and uh, she is from Glenville. She wants to talk about city grass on her lot, did a bad job and for no reason, and why is there no paint job, paint program? Is Ms. Lett uh, available? Ms. Lett, Mickey Hardwick Lett. Okay, Mickey Hardwick Lett is not available. We'll move on to the next person. We have Chris from Euclid, and he's here to talk about water rates. Is Chris from Euclid here? Please acknowledge your time. When the light turns yellow, that means that wrap up, and then red means uh, to end your comments. Thank you. Good evening, Cleveland City Council. You ever notice that you can find an error in a law? So your law 535.04 is stating 0.6. Check online and it says 0.2. <clears throat> Going through a pandemic, what was the first thing we were told to do? Wash our hands. We're not against Cleveland. I come from a city 
where my rate is $8 higher in East 200th Street is Cleveland and East 193rd in, 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 in Green Road is Cleveland, Euclid. Now you could say the same thing for Shaker Heights, Lee Road, they're close to different suburbs. I took this and sent everybody a copy. The consumption, it's already flowing through the water. It's already flowing through the streets. Try it. Give us 3.0 MCFs. Let these families take care of themselves. Now when we talk about, I understand that. I come from a city that my politician said we gonna serve it on to you, the resident. EPA filed a lawsuit against the city of Euclid. EPA and the federal government needs to give us money. Same thing happened here in Cleveland. Two point billion dollars, now it's 2.5. This infrastructure for Ms. Harris, our vice president, and our president Joe Biden, along with council, gives us the opportunity on infrastructure to stop this, get ahead of the game. I got one minute left. I want to talk about the opportunity that this Cleveland Council has. With a new administration, and you're the legislative body, we could do petition work, but we're asking your vote right now. This is a legacy to fix the problem. And you got botched water building systems from the Cleveland Plain Dealer that wrote. If you look at pie graphs, it shows an upward trend. All I can say is that we need, and that's each individual, that's 17 grown people, to one of these days, in the next two weeks to three weeks to four weeks, come back to this chamber and sponsor it the entire city council, along with Mayor Bibb. Thank Time. you. Thank you. Next up, we have Juan Collado, and he is from Ward 17, and he's here to talk about 50 mil for military weapons. Uh, Mr. Collado, Juan Collado. Is Juan Collado here? Juan Collado, going once, going twice. I don't see Mr. Collado. We're going to now move to uh, Rico Dancy. Mr. Dancy, you have the floor. Please acknowledge that your time is to wrap up when it turns uh, yellow. And when it gets red, that means that your comments are to abruptly end. Welcome, Mr. Dancy. Good afternoon, Mr. Fisher. I am a certified deaf interpreter. I'm the president of Black Lives Matter. Please speak into the microphone so we oh, can hear I'm sorry. You. I'm a certified deaf interpreter. I'm, the, I'm an AC commissioner of the District of Columbia. In the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. is the only police place in the country who have a deaf or hard hearing unit. This month is Deaf Awareness Month. I'm going to be awarded Southeast this Saturday. So when I look at a deaf community, disabled, blind, you name it. You name it. I fight 27 years ago, been arrested because one officer forced me to interpret. Now, I want y'all to understand the ADA law says you have to use a certified interpreter, not a friend, not a mama, not a daddy, not an uncle, not a brother. Have your officer, somebody need to come to DC we have a deaf and hard to hear law enforcement unit. If we could do it in D.C., I know damn hell we could do it here and all across this country. And I'm tired going to fight. Every year in September, a deaf person died because an officer shoot them, killed them because they are signing. Signing. Because the officer is not aware about deaf education. I went to one of the best deaf college in this country, got at that university, become a certified and deaf interpreter. If I could come certified, the only black one, 
somebody needs to do something. Come to DC. See how we run our debt hardening unit. Come to God in debt and see how we run there. Then I will have to come here and fight for my people. I fight for my people every single day. Someone do something. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dancy. Thank you so much, Mr. Dancy, and welcome back. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please read the communications. <clears throat> File number 970-2022 from Council President Blaine A. Griffin, designating Alan Dreyer without objection by Council to be Clerk Pro Tem for the September 19th, 2022 Council meeting. File number 947-2022 from Mayor Justin M. Bibb, City of Cleveland, appointments to Cleveland City Planning Committee, uh, appointments to Cleveland City Planning Commission to be considered by Council's Mayor's Appointments Committee. File number 969-2022, oath of office for, for Dorothy A. Todd, Deputy Chief of Police, Division of Police, Department of Public Safety, City of Cleveland. For, from the Ohio Division of Liquor Control, file number 948-2022, uh, economic Development Transfer Application for Patron Saint LLC, 2915 Detroit Avenue in Ward 3. Are there any condolence resolutions? Resolution number 959-2022 for Council Member Griffin for David A. Arnold. For Council Members Griffin and House, resolution number 960-2022 for Barbara Jean Shack. For Councilman Jones, uh, resolution number 961-2022 for Malik Lathan Brooks. Are there any other condolences? Does Council have any other condolences? Seeing no other condolences, uh, Councilman Mike Polensic. Would the clerk please hold out a number for Jack Borky? Thank you very much. All right. Councilwoman Santana. Can you hold out a number for Sister Alicia? And I forget her last name. Alicia Alvarado? Alvarado, yes. Oh, wow. I didn't know she passed. Yeah, she okay. just passed away this week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other condolence resolutions? Seeing no other condolence resolutions, will all council members rise for a moment of silence. Thank you. Are there any congratulatory resolutions? For council member Gray, resolution number 962-2022 for Apostle Joan E. Walker. For council member Griffin, resolution number 963-2022 for Dr. Laura Bloomberg. Council member, for, for Council Member Griffin, resolution number 964-2022 for Catherine J. Heideman. Resolutions of recognition for Council Member Bishop, resolution number 965-2022 for Maggie Hale's 100th birthday. For Council Member Bishop, resolution number 966-2022 for Lloyd E. Allen. For Council Member Griffin, resolution number 967-2022 for Lisa Ray. Resolution of welcome for Council Member Griffin, resolution number 968-2022 for Katlyn Novak, President of Hungary. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, we now have presentations. First, I want to bring up uh, Councilwoman Rebecca Mora, Ward 12 Councilwoman Rebecca Mora. And I believe we are going to welcome up the family of Davia Garth and uh, ask council members if they can open up the well uh, so that uh, the families can uh, walk in and escort, be escorted in. Thank you, Council President. There are many different types of days at this job. On some days, we get to dream really big about the city of Cleveland. We get to think about it from 50,000 feet and wheel and deal with my colleagues here on millions of dollars of ARPA legislation. And on other days, we're focused on one family, 
on one street. And then there are days where we do both of those at the same time. And I'm honored tonight to stand next to Miss Sonia Garth uh, in honor of her daughter, um, Davia Alexis Garth, who was killed in a tragic incident of domestic violence eight years ago. Mrs. Garth has worked tirelessly in the years since her daughter's murder to raise awareness around domestic violence and is known throughout the community for her work. And that is why tonight I am proud to support the honorary secondary name change of Clement Avenue to Davia Alexis Garthway. I will hand it over to Ms. Garth to share a little bit about her daughter's experiences. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sonia Garth, and I'm here to speak on my daughter, Davia Garth. She's not here, her voice is silent, so I have to be the one that speaks for her. <sighs> my baby was, was totally different. You know, she loved everybody. She couldn't find anything wrong with, with, with anybody, just was happy all the time. You know, every time you've seen her, you, she had a smile on her face, so when she smiled, so everybody just smiled every time they seen her. So me as a mother, I don't want people to forget about domestic violence. See, domestic violence didn't choose, she didn't choose domestic violence, domestic violence chose her. And me as a mother who have lost her daughter and be gone almost eight years. I have to keep her memory out there. I don't want people to forget her saying that, hey, you know, she was, her mom was in the domestic violence and um, she lost her life, but her life meant something to me. You know, every day of my life, it used to be bright, very bright, to now to where it's dark. And me as a mother, I couldn't protect her. You know, because he, he shot me four times, and here I'm, I'm still standing, but yet my daughter's not here. And she was the best thing that came into my life. And by me getting a street name, I just, I just worked so hard for her. You know, I even went out and got my car done, but it said in domestic violence with her picture on the hood to let everybody know that I'm, I'm trying to send a message that I never want to see nobody have to go through what I went through. And I'm telling you, it's very painful. You know, I'm going for kisses every day, every night to I love you to where it's nothing. You know, sometimes I had to put in my head, oh, she didn't been here, she didn't told me she loved me. It's hard. It's hard as a mother to never see your daughter again. So with the street name, I just, you know, she grew up there. She was born there. So I just feel that it's only right that it's a street name after her because, you know, she didn't survive domestic violence. I did. So as long as I got breath in my body, I'm going to make sure that don't nobody never forget my daughter because her life meant something. And the rest of the people who have lost their lives through domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Councilwoman, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Garth. Our prayers and our thoughts are always with you and your family on behalf of all of Council. Thank you. Um, next up, I do want to bring up Councilman Kevin Conwell, and I believe he is going to bring up um, some members that he would like to recognize uh, for the resolution that we just passed around equal pay for African-American women. I believe he does want uh, Councilwoman House and Councilwoman Gray to join him. And could the members open up the well? Um, you as well, Mr. President, and okay. uh, Young Star, and bring up uh, Santana. Council Lady Santana and uh, Slife, Council Member Slife, and I'm going to yield to the uh, to the sisters. I yield to you, Council Lady House. House. You know, you guys were champion this. You and Council Lady Gray. So I yield to you guys. You good? 
Yes, okay. Ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, um, for those who don't know, um, on Wednesday, September 21st, it is recognized as Black Women's Equal Pay Day, which is the time that signifies um, the amount of women the amount of time it takes for black women to catch up in their earnings compared to their white male counterparts from the previous year. Um, and as a result of COVID-19, um, there has actually been, a, it, has, it has gotten bigger. Um, it used to be 62 cents to the dollar, and now it is back down to 58 cents to the dollar um, as a result of COVID-19, which means black women on average are working 19 months um, compared to their white male counterparts for 12 months. And so uh, taking the moment of actually bringing this awareness to our community and hopefully having community members um, to not only know about it, but actually work in their workplaces to really close the, 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 the wage disparity gap um, and hopefully working with our partners in Cleveland City Council to make sure that we are doing what we can to sh in invest in women and families so that the economic security that people deserve can actually happen not only in the city of Cleveland, but all through this country. So thank you very much, Councilman Conwell. I just want to say this is a great day for black women in power to move ahead and to be known that we have worked together to push this together. So I um, echo everything that Councilwoman House has said. So I'm just appreciative that we were able to do that and thank and thank the council members, you know, to pass this today. 100 percent. 100 percent. I appreciate that. Um, good evening. My name is Chi Chi Inkamara. I am the director of strategy and co-founder for Enlightened Solutions. That's a think tank here in Cleveland, Ohio. I am passionate about Black Women's Equal Pay Day, not only because I am a black woman, but because I would like to birth the next generation of Clevelanders. Cleveland is 38% black, 48% within our city. That means that black women within our cities are not being paid equitably. That's 2.5 years of childcare that black women could be utilizing. That's 174 weeks of groceries. That's three years of groceries. If we're looking at how we can actually equitably move this city, we need to start putting pressure on our corporations, our nonprofits, and guided by city government to make sure that not one more black woman is underpaid for her brilliance, her expertise, and her perspective. You know, when you look at this resolution, we passed the resolution, so what does it mean? It means that if we have to go down state with you, uh, we have to fight this fight for uh, equal pay for African American sisters, we will do that. Three quarters of the head of the household in my neighborhood is ran by African American females. And as you just narrated, we gotta be there right, right along with the sisters fighting hand in hand. If we could push a resolution, that's cool beans. But we have to be there right next to you fighting to make sure that, that this happen. So I'm there, city council stands with you, and we're there 100%. Thank you. Mm. Here's your resolution, here's the resolution. Oh, appreciate you. Share. Um, I would like to. Okay. Yes. 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 Awesome. Anybody else want to say anything? Just we recognizing end? our board members that are here: April Walker and Fallon Peterson. They get need to hear you on the microphone. Thank you. Just recognizing our awesome board members here: Fallon Peterson and April Walker, our board chair. Right. <laughs> Can we have all women of council to join us for this? I think it would be important for all women of council. Very good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Everybody, 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 come on up. Those members, oh, he did. So I'm coming out anyway. It's a human issue. No, it no, it's a family issue. It's that's right. Everybody. Uh, that's it right. Use the steps. Use the ladder. Three steps we got going for you right here. Ladies up front, please. Right. Ladies up front. 
Casey. You can't wait to put Casey on your. He's going on my list, Casey. Casey, I need a good one. Casey's going on my list. You have to. Okay. Are you ready, Alan? Mr. Clerk, please give first reading emergency ordinances referred for administrative review and committee review. Ordinance number 949-2022 by Council Members Casey and Griffin by Departmental Request. <clears throat> the emergency ordinance to amend the title in Section 4 of Ordinance number 732-2020, past November 18, 2020, and to supplement the ordinance by adding new Sections 3A, 3B, and 3C relating to the public improvement of rehabilitating Kirtland Crib to add authority to apply for and accept one or more water supply revolving loan account loans for this project. Oh, ordinance number 950-2022 by Council Member Griffin by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the purchase by one or more requirement contracts of natural gas for silly facilities and to employ energy suppliers and or development firms to supply natural gas to city facilities for a period of up to three years with two options to renew of up to one year each exercisable by the Director of Finance. Cool. All right. The next thing is... Uh, Mr. Clerk, can you have first reading emergency ordinances to be passed? <clears throat> Orders number 951-2022 by Councilmember Polensic. An emergency ordinance authorizing the director of the Department of Community Development to enter into an, an agreement with LMB Consulting LLC to provide consulting services for the commercial revitalization services for the East 185th Street project through the use of Ward 8 casino revenue funds. Ordinance number 952-2022 by Council Member Griffin by departmental request. An emergency ordinance approving the collective bargaining agreement with the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge number 8 and to amend section 54 of ordinance number 194-2021 March 29, 2021 as amended relating to compensation for various classifications. Ordinance number 953-2022 by Council Member Griffin by departmental request. An emergency ordinance approving the collective bargaining agreement with the Service Employees International Union Local 1 to amend section 7 of ordinance number 194-2021 passed March 29, 2021 as amended relating to compensation for various classifications. Thank you. Read the motion to suspend the rules. By Council Member Hairston that the rules be suspended and the legislation be and the legislation just read be placed on final passage seconded by Council Member Mooney. Thank you. Call the roll. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Hairston, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormack, Mooney, Plunsick, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. Fifteen yeas, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Please call the roll on passage. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Hairston, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, M M McCormack, Mooney, Plunsick, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. Fifteen yeas. Thank you. First reading ordinances referred for administrative review and committee review. Ordinance number 955-2022 by Council Member Griffin, an ordinance changing the use area and height districts of parcels of land along East 89th Street between Cedar Avenue and Quincy Avenue, map change 2654. Ordinance number 956-2022 by Council Member Moore, an, an ordinance changing the use area and height districts of parcels of land west of Pearl Road and north of Broadway Road and adding an urban form overlay as identified on the attached map, map change number 2623. First reading, emergency resolutions referred for administrative review and committee review. Resolution number 954-2022 by Council Member Griffin. Is that it? An emergency 
a resolution establishing a working committee of the Council, the administration, and community stakeholders to study community benefits agreement policies and ordinances and consider implementing a city policy and ordinance to ensure that development projects provide maximized tangible benefits to Cleveland's communities and citizens and improve reporting practices and public accessibility to workforce and community benefits data and, and information. Thank you. First reading emergency resolutions to be adopted. Resolution number 957-2022 by Council Members Conwell, Santana, Gray, House, Jones, Bishop, McCormack, Starr, Griffin, Palenza, Kirsten, Mooney, Moore, Harsh, Spencer, Casey, Slife. An emergency resolution recognizing Black Women's Equal Pay Day to be, to, to be celebrated on September 21, 2022. Resolution number 958 by Council Member by Councilmember McCormack, an emergency resolution approving the recommendation of the Committee on Council Operations re regarding hiring certain, certain employees by Cleveland City Council. Read a motion to suspend the rules. A motion by Councilmember Harrison that the rules be suspended and the legislation just read be placed on final passage. Seconded by Councilmember Mooney. Call the roll. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Hairston, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormack, Mooney, Polensic, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. Call the roll on adoption. 15 days. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Hairston, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormack, Mooney, Polensic, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. 16 days. Thank you. Second reading, emergency ordinances to be passed. Ordinance number 759-2022 by Council Members Bishop and Griffin by Department of Request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the purchase by one or more standard and requirement contracts for the purchase, lease, or lease with option to purchase of various on-road vehicles, apparatus, and off-road equipment, cabs, bodies, and accessories, equipment, and other aftermarket items necessary to equip the vehicles authorized for their intended purposes, including vehicle re re rehabilitation, training, and inspections as needed for the Departments of Public Utilities and Port Control. Orders number 761-2022 by Council Members Bishop and Griffin by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the purchase by one or more standard and requirement contracts for the purchase, lease, or lease with option to purchase of various on-road vehicles, apparatus, and off-road equipment, cabs, bodies, and accessories, equipment, and other aftermarket items necessary to equip the vehicles authorized for their intended purposes, including vehicle re rehabilitation, training, and inspections as needed for the various divisions of city government. Ordinance number 765 as amended by Council Members Plunsick and Griffin by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Public Safety to enter into contracts or amendments to contract number CT6002 SG 2022 015 with Exceptor Radio Corporation. With, with Exceptor Radar Corporation to permit Exceptor to sell access to radar data derived from the city's radar system to third parties in exchange for certain maintenance and upgrade services from Exceptor at no charge to the city. And to amend Section 5 of Ordinance Number 674-2020, passed September 9, 2020. Ordinance number 766-2022 by Council Members Bishop and Griffin by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Public Works to enter into one or more agreements with the State of Ohio Department of Transportation to provide services necessary for snow and ice removal and general routine maintenance and repair of, of a portion of State Route 176 for a period of one year with two one-year options to renew exercisable by the Director of Public Works. Ordinance number 859 by Mayor Bibb, an emergency ordinance to amend Section 123.09 of the Codified Ordinances of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976, as amended by Ordinance number 69-17, passed January 30, 2017, to change the name of the Office of Quality Control and Performance Management to the Office of Urban An Analytics and Innovation. Ordinance number 863-2022 by Council Member Griffin by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Finance on behalf of the Cleveland Municipal Court to apply for and accept a grant from the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board of Cuyahoga County for the 2022-2023 Specialized Dockets Program and authorizing the Director to enter into one or more contracts with various agencies, entities, or individuals to implement the grant purposes. Ordinance number 865-2022 by Councilmember Moore, an emergency ordinance to add the name Davia Alexis Garth Way as a secondary and honorary name to Clement Avenue between East 67th Street and East 71st Street. Ordinance number 871-2022 by Councilmember Griffin, an emergency ordinance to amend Section 4 of Ordinance number 194-2021, passed March 29, 2021, as amended relating to compensation for various classifications. 
Ordinance number 880-2022 by Council Member Griffin and by Department of Request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Finance to enter into one or more agreements with Honeywell International to accept the gift of professional services for the purpose of creating a smart city strategic plan and smart city roadmap and authorizing any agreements or documents necessary to implement this ordinance. Ordinance number 884-2022 by Council Member Griffin by Departmental Request. Emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Finance to enter into one or more agreements with Case Western Reserve University and Cleveland State University to develop and establish a proof of concept solution to monitor and address illegal dumping activities utilizing a smart city initiative. By AH Ordinance number 887-2022 by Council Member Griffin by Departmental Request. An emergency ordinance to amend section one of ordinance number 1033-2021, passed November 22, 2021, relating to appropriating American Rescue Plan Act funding for professional legal services for professional legal services contract or contracts to assist the city in matters relating to regulatory compliance and, and eligible use of funds. Read the motion to suspend the rules. Sorry. Oh, we got more. Ordinance number 896, as amended by Council Members Griffin, Plensick, and Mayor Bibb. An emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Public Safety to employ one or more professional consultants to one or more professional consultants, computer software developers, or vendors to acquire licenses to outfit in fleet dash cameras in, in frontline division of police vehicles, including but not limited to software configuration, installation, cloud storage, and equipment, and authorizing various written standard purchase and requirement contracts, if not obtained through the professional service contract, for a period of up to five years for the, for the division of police, department of public safety, and authorizing the director to apply for and accept grants or gifts. Ordinance number 897 as amended by Council Member Griffin and Mayor Bibb. An emergency ordinance directing a portion of the city's coronavirus local fiscal recovery fund payment to the city's COVID-19 response by authorizing the Director of Health to enter into one or more subrecipient agreements with the Cleveland Foundation to assist with the dollar for doses programs to provide incentives for COVID, for COVID vaccinations to be encumbered beginning March 3, 2021 and ending December 31st, 2024. Ordinance number 903-2022 as amended by Council Member Griffin and Mayor Bibb. An emergency ordinance directing a portion of the city's coronavirus local fiscal recovery fund payment to the city's COVID-19 response by authorizing the Director of Public Safety to enter into one or more grant agreements with Canopy Child, with, with Canopy Child Advocacy Center, Inc. to assist with services provided to victims of child abuse to be encumbered beginning March 3, 2021 and ending December 31, 2024. Ordinance number 904-2022 as amended by Council Member Griffin and Mayor Bibb. An emergency ordinance directing a portion of the city's coronavirus local fiscal recovery fund payment to the city's COVID-19 response by authorizing the Director of Public Safety to enter into one or more agreements with the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center to assist with services to victims of sexual violence and to provide assistance to mitigate financial hardship and offset administrative costs from COVID-19 to be encumbered March 3, 2021 and ending December 30. 1, 2024. Ordinance number 905 as amended by Council Member Griffin and Mayor Bibb. An emergency ordinance directing a portion of the city's coronavirus local fiscal recovery fund payment to the city's COVID-19 response by authorizing the Director of Finance to enter into one or more subrecipient sub recipient agreements with Child Care Resource Center of Cuyahoga County, DBA Starting Point, to assist with an early childhood recovery initiative signing and retention program to be encumbered March 3, 2021 and ending December 31, 2024. <coughs> Ordinance number 906-2022 as amended by Council Member Griffin and Mayor Bibb. An emergency ordinance directing a portion of the city's coronavirus local fiscal recovery fund payment to the city's COVID-19 response by authorizing the Director of Finance to enter into one or more subrecipient agreements with Child Care Resource Center of Cuyahoga County DBA starting point to assist with an early childhood recovery initiative family child care scholarship program to be encumbered March 3, 2021 and ending December 31, 2024. Ordinance number 907 is amended by Council Member Griffin and Mayor Bibb. An emergency ordinance directing a portion of the city's coronavirus local fiscal recovery fund payment to the city's COVID-19 response by authorizing Director of Public Safety to enter one or more grant agreements with Journey Center for Safety and Healing to assist with services provided to, to victims of domestic violence to be encumbered beginning March 3, 2021 and ending December 31, 2024. Ordinance number 908 as amended by Council Member Griffin and Mayor Bibb. An emergency ordinance directing a portion of the city's coronavirus local fiscal recovery fund payment to the city's COVID-19 
COVID-19 response by authorizing the Director of Community Development to enter into one or more sub agreements with the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland to provide legal and other services and resources to Cleveland residents facing eviction to be encumbered March uh, be, to be encumbered beginning March 3, 2021 and ending December 31, 2024. Read the motion to suspend the rules. Motion by Councilmember Hairston that the rules be suspended and the legislation just read be placed on final passage. Second by Councilmember Moody. Call the roll. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Hairston, Hare, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormack, Mooney, Palencic, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. 17 yeas. Call the roll on passage. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Hairston, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormack, Mooney, Palencic, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. 17 yeas. Please uh, record me a no on 897-2022. Thank you. All right, second reading, emergency resolutions to be adopted. Resolution number 878-2022 by Council Member Griffin by Department of Request. An emergency resolution accepting amounts and rates as determined by the Cuyahoga County Budget Commission and authorizing the necessary tax levies and certifying them to, to the county fiscal officer. Resolution number 879-2022 by Council Member Griffin by Department of Request. An emergency resolution requesting the county fiscal officer to make advances during the year 2023 pursuant to section 321.34 of the Ohio Revised Code. Read the motion to suspend the rules. By Councilmember Hairston, that the, that the rules be suspended and the legislation just read be placed on final passage, seconded by Councilmember Mooney. Call the roll. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Hairston, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormick, Mooney, Plansick, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. 17 yeas. Call the roll on adoption. Griffin, Bishop, Conwell, Gray, Hairston, Harsh, House, Jones, Casey, Moore, McCormick, Mooney, Palencic, Santana, Slife, Spencer, Starr. 17 yeas. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Are there any introductions? Any introductions? Councilman Joe Jones. Mr. Chairman, I just want to just take the time to um, uh, introduce uh, Cameron, Jim, and Otto of SEIU Local 1. If they're here, still here. Will the members of SEIU Local 1 please stand? Yeah. Thank what? you. It's really good to see them here and to see how they have worked hand in glove with the administration to hammer out the differences and issues. So again, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Councilman. Are there any other introductions, Councilman? Uh, Councilman Palencic, Councilman, Councilman McCormick. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't think I'm on. Is he on? Councilman McCormick on? No. Could you uh, turn Councilman McCormick on? There we go. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, welcome the Government Relations Dream Teams, Marty McGann and Michelle Pomerantz. Thank you, Councilman Kevin Conwell. Yes, 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 Mr. President. I'd like to uh, include our son, Kevin Jr. Thank you for volunteering for the City Council in 2003, 2004, 2005. He volunteered and he used to work in uh, Washington. Now he's out in his own business. He, he is a real man. He's mastering his own destiny. So thank you very, very much. Love you here. Sound like a proud dad. I know he's here and he doesn't need any introduction because he's here all the time, but a good friend of council and a good friend of all of ours, Danny Kelly, I'm going to ask if he could stand up, please. All right, and then I always have to acknowledge Ward 6 residents when they come down here. Usually she's speaking on the mic, but she is one of my renowned Ward 6 leaders, Miss uh, Wanda Hill Chestnut, if she could please stand. And I also want to take a moment to acknowledge from the Center for Community Solutions, I think their whole team and Legal Aid Society, if they could all stand, the Legal Aid Society. 
Are there any more? Uh, are there any more acknowledgments or introductions? Seeing no other acknowledgments or introductions, are there any announcements? Any announcements? Any announcements? I do want to remind everybody that they can park for free, so please let everyone know um, in our listening audience that the back upper deck of City Hall, you can park for free. So we want to invite the public to come down as much as possible, just so that you can know. Um, any other announcements, Councilman Mike Polensic? Announcement miscellaneous. Uh, announcements. You ready to go miscellaneous? Okay, seeing no other announcements, I'll now move to miscellaneous. Councilman Mike Polensic, Dean of Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam uh, Acting Clerk, Honorable Mayor, Administration, my colleagues. First of all, I want to um, to uh, rise and uh, commend all my colleagues for the due diligence that they've done over the um, ARPA funds. It's been a great, great lengthy process. And again, I commend all my colleagues who've been here for all the meetings and gatherings, et cetera, to hear and discuss the ARPA funds in detail. Mr. Chairman, I want to rise to, uh, first of all, to indicate to all members of the council, not this coming Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, we will hear in safety at 10 o'clock uh, the um, shot spotter legislation. So I know there are concerns within the body, there are questions within the body. So again, I've asked through an email today for any member who has concerns, questions, to please put those to Antilly, and then we'll put those over to the safety director, the chief, uh, to see if we can get all those requests in early so we have the committee hearing that all the uh, questions that we might have, they'll have the data for us. I want to commend the mayor, the safety director, the chief, uh, you, Mr. President, and my colleagues for supporting Ordinance 896-2022, and that is the dash cams. Um, this has been a, a process that I have long supported, implementation of this technology. Um, we fought years ago, a, cr a group of us in council, to get the, the body cams. And um, some people maybe thought it was an easy process. It wasn't. There were people who were opposed to the dash, to the body cams, believe it or not. They didn't want, they didn't want the body cams. I could never figure it out. Why not? But they were, and we overcame that, and we implemented the body cams. And as a result of implementation of the body cams, complaints against the police department have gone down 56%. So what does that tell you right there? They've worked. They worked on behalf of the members of CPD and our citizenry because cameras don't lie. For years, I lobbied and asked for the implementation of dash cams. Some officers implemented them on their own, paid for their own cameras in the cars. But again, I want to thank the administration. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank my colleagues for realizing that this has been a long time coming. Years and years ago, I'm a longtime member of the NAACP. We talked about this years ago, about helping to level the playing field to protect not only our men and women in blue, but the citizens who believe they were being stopped because they happened to be in the wrong neighborhood or they are wrong ethnic or racial persuasion. This is gonna clear that up real quickly and would have cleared it up years ago, but now we're here today. So it tells me we've come a long way in these past eight months, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're making things happen that should have happened a long time ago. And I think it's because, and I truly believe it's because you have a council that's more committed in deep diving more than ever before, and you have an administration that's listening, that's listening to the citizens, that wants to get things done. And if we continue that process, Mr. Chairman, there's no saying what we can't do in this city. So again, I want to thank you and all my colleagues in the administration. The dash cams, long time overdue, and finally it's here. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership on that, Councilman. I know that this has been a passion of yours, and it's great to see us have the opportunity to get this done. I have uh, Councilwoman Jenny Spencer, and then I believe Councilman Richard Starr. Councilwoman Spencer. Thank you, Council President. Good evening, colleagues. Um, there are two numbers that are top of mind for me tonight. The first number is 50. We are 50 days out from Election Day today. And the second number is 22. There are 22 days left to register to vote. Um, tomorrow, 
September 20th is National Voter Registration Day. Uh, I have some uh, fun pop-ups going on in my ward tomorrow, and uh, Cleveland Votes has a listing on their, on their website of events going on all across the city. If you go to clevevotes.com backslash events, it has a listing of their events. So I know we are all passionately committed to local government, which is why we signed up for our jobs. But when I think about the lives of Clevelanders, I don't think much else is more important than the outcome of the midterm, midterm elections for the lives of Clevelanders. <laughs> um, so, you know, whether the CHIPS Act or the Inflation Reduction Act, let's talk about the amazing wins, the great work that Democrats are doing. So we need to elect Tim Ryan and retain control of the Senate. We need to elect Nan Whaley as governor, and we need to elect Bruner, Zayas, and Jamison to the Ohio Supreme Court. There is so much at stake for the lives of Clevelanders with these midterm elections, and I'm hopeful that we can get our voter turnout up and our people more connected to, to democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilman Richard Starr. Um, good evening, um, body and everyone. Uh, today I wanted to rise because of um, just something that's been on my heart since Tuesday evening. Um, when I got home Tuesday evening, um, I received a call asking me for an statement uh, regarding St. Vincent's Charity Hospital closing. Uh, mind you, it's 9.45, so you know I'm fresh out the shower, uh, trying to get my thoughts together, right? So I take this call, and I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, no, they're getting ready to make an announcement tomorrow. So next thing you know, just frustration and emotions just start coming out of me. The reason why I'm hurt is because it seems as if hospitals in African-American communities is not lasting long enough. When you look at all the different hospitals that has closed, even, even out in Bedford, even out in Richmond this past August, when you think about Huron, St. Luke's, all those areas that we're talking about is areas where African-Americans that look like myself live. Now, one thing that, that, that frustrates me is when you start looking at to the data and you are understanding when you're from central neighborhood, either you got UH on Euclid or we're going to Metro. So when you talk about the crime and the violence that goes on in my neighborhood, this is where life or death situation comes. And St. Vincent's Charity since 1865 have been in the central neighborhood. For them to pop up and leave is unacceptable disrespectful to the residents, disrespectful to this body, and even myself as elected official without having an up-to-date information. When you have met with this organization myself almost six or seven times this year within the last nine months, never was it brought up that they were looking to close. Never did they think about that. But you know what was brought up? The fact that they want a health campus. So when you start thinking about that on Tuesday night, from them saying you want a health campus for the last nine months to them just suddenly closing, is disgraceful. When I think about it, my colleagues, I thank you, Council President, for, for talking to me that night. I thank you, uh, Councilman Michael Lenz, the Dean, because we had to talk about some real data. 3,900 EMS units have attended St. Vincent's Charity on average. 3,900. So if something happens and you're on 55th, 79th, Quincy, North Broadway, Midtown, and something happens, you can't go to charity now. You gotta try to make it to Metro. That is a problem. So what I want to rise today and, and talk to all of you all um, about coming together and understanding that the world-class healthcare center is not in Cleveland no more if hospitals keep leaving Northeast Ohio. And we need to work together with the administration, with the county, and the state to ensure that we have health care facilities such as the EMS in our neighborhood with full services. And I, that's all I have tonight, Chair. Thank you.
Councilman, I commend you for speaking up for the residents and speaking up, and I know that um, we're going to continue to back you and make sure that we also look out for those workers that um, are going to lose out on this opportunity as well. So we're going to back you and be full in support with you, okay? Councilman Charles Slife. Thank you, Mr. President, and um, uh, just in response, thank you, Councilman Starr, for uh, that, that, those very important words. Uh, Councilman Conwell and I, as uh, the chair and vice chair of the Health and Arts Committee, are working together to bring St. Vincent Charity in, the Sisters of Charity, uh, so that they can uh, explain this decision to Council, so that we can ask questions. Uh, as you've stated, a, a critical health care service for the central neighborhood, also for people experiencing uh, mental health crises uh, across the entire city. Uh, uh, Councilman Moore's assistant, Catherine, who's here, uh, wrote a very poignant piece yes. on, on the importance of, of that service to her family. So, so I think it is worth exploring, and, and it's just, you know, speaking for myself, uh, statements that they, we are going to reduce medical services and, and focus on health disparities seems counterintuitive. Uh, so I'm interested in hearing more about that. Thank you, Councilman Slife. I'm going to go to Councilman Joe Jones. Councilman Joe Jones. Thank you, Mr. President, and to the administration. Um, there was a time in the city of Cleveland when the focus was how we grow the city of Cleveland and how we get population back to the city of Cleveland. We heard uh, a distinguished young lady talk about where she lives and how it was um, depressing for her to have a vacant lot situation and they're not cutting the grass on the east side of the city of Cleveland. And I know that a lot of us sat um, this morning and talked about the various different legislation and public uh, works uh, and what it meant to get some of the new equipment in. But if we're going to get serious about bringing population back to the city of Cleveland, uh, then we have to get serious about improving our educational system. One of the reasons why we lose part of our population is because we don't have an educational system that's up to par. And we need to get an educational system that's competitive to the school systems around us. Uh, the second issue which is major to our, to our city is economic development. We can't just have one part of the city or certain sections of the city economically growing. We have to have the entire city of Cleveland moving at the same pace. And I just left Nashville, Tennessee, and Nashville, Tennessee doesn't have anything on the city of Cleveland but one thing, and that's economic development. They don't have our land, they don't have our region, and one of the things they really don't have is the greatest asset that we have, and that's Lake Erie. They have a crooked bend that smells, and we have Lake Erie. And now, what's really deep about Nashville, Tennessee, even though they have country music, we have rock and roll. We are the city of rock and roll. We should have our own rock and roll. I know we have our museum, but we should have our music hall. We should start talking about having the same kind of development they have. Do you know they have 20, I count it, 27 building cranes in downtown Nashville, Tennessee, 27 another 24 to 30 projects in condo development. They're building every crack and crevice all throughout Nashville, Tennessee, and we should have it going here. So if we begin the process to talk about how we improve our educational system, how we streamline our processes so we can get new development. I've been working very hard to get a housing development in my neighborhood. Do you know I'm here four months and four years and eight months later, and I still don't have that housing development in my neighborhood. I'm still going through a process that's sad. Here in the city of Cleveland, if we're gonna get serious about moving forward and bringing more people to the city of Cleveland, then we need to improve our processes. And as for those vacant lots, we should send, we should send the message, an RFP out on every single lot for new, con new construction development, we'll give those lots away for $1. If you start doing that, you're, you're cultivate and stimulate that ground foundation and we can start doing something. I know my time is running out, but I love Cleveland and I'm hoping that all ears are listening. Let's improve our educational system. Let's bring economic development here and let's start talking about how we can cut vacant lots 
and secure and keep our citizens safe. Thank you, Mr. President, to the administration. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate it. I just have to ask, did you say 27 billion cranes? No. I would, I would, I would like that if I get a chance to get back on that <laughs> okay. and speak some more. Uh, that's 27 right. building cranes. Got you. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Just want to make sure we clarified it. Uh, Councilman Kevin Conwell, and then I think I have Councilwoman Deborah Gray. And I was listening and watching Young Star. You know, Star, I've been through that with a, you mentioned here in hospital. Uh, Michael Polinsic and I have been through it with a lot of different hospitals leaving. And what the council president said, I watched him on TV, that um, when they start pulling one thing, then it's another, and it's another, and it's another, and then they're gone, and it's a chain reaction. Isn't that right, Councilman uh, Mike Polensic? So what we'll do, you'll get with um, Councilman um, Slife, and then we'll put some questions, and within two weeks, we'll have them to come to um, city council, to the health um, committee, we get some questions, and then we figure out where we need to go, because we have to seek to understand what's going on. So we need at least call them in within two weeks. So you meet with Ann Telly also, and then we'll reach out to bring them here, and then we'll bring the administration, because if they knew um, several months ago, that's not right, and they never told you. So we'll try to, matter of fact, we'll get down to the bottom of it. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Councilman Conwell. Councilwoman Deborah Gray. I just want to announce that I am having my first community festival in Ward 4. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be from 10 to 7 at um, Luth Eastern Park. So please, if you have time, come enjoy. And I have an open stage for anyone that has any entertainment or any talent. Come and just show your worth. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. September 24th, this Saturday. This Saturday, September 24th. 24th. Yes. And please let the council know, I know that I have a previous engagement, but please make sure that all the members know because we need to support each other's events, okay? Uh, I want to take a quick moment of personal privilege. I want uh, Director McNamara to please stand, if she could please stand. Last week... Last week, about 1,500 seniors were able to convene at Public Hall, and Director McNamara and her team at uh, the administration put on a great event. It was so powerful, and the reason I thought about it is because most of these seniors have been living and impacted with uncertainty and not really interacting or socializing with the outside world for the last two years because of COVID-19. And you could just see the joy and the fact that they were able to convene again and really be able to socialize and get out in public. And I just thought that that event was so powerful, and it just says a lot for all of our legacy citizens. So kudos and appreciate Mayor Bibb, as well as uh, Director McNamara for such a great event. So thank you, kudos, appreciate it. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, please excuse the absences. None. No absences. All right, great. Uh, Council is adjourned to the next regular meeting on September 26, 2022. Hey, Tess.